Hey, it's Tim with the University of Vinyl. I'm not here today to to say that Billie Eilish and her brother, who is it, Phineas? Phineas? They're definitely a talented combo. I love the teamwork that they have, and the music is compelling. No argument for me there. But, but, <laughs> today I'm going to take a look at the, the years between 1981 and 1984, just because I have an album from 81 that I wanted to start with and an album from 84 that I wanted to end with. And all of these albums, they're kind of of a, of a period and of a time. And maybe even of a place. Uh, and that was, that was Great Britain. Um, the place is, is the least important of any of those items I mentioned. Um, but, you know, like, like Billy and her brother, reportedly, they, they came up with their first album in their bedroom using a lot of sampling, a lot of digital techniques. The bands that I want to feature between 81 and 1984, all those years and decades ago, they were industrious as well, but it took a lot more effort. And they were actually creating their own samples using analog tape loops you know, laying down a track and then methodically moving on to the next thing and recording that and then combining tracks, etc., etc. Uh, it's so much easier today to do that work. And there are people who will argue that there's a lot less talent involved in that kind of an exercise in 2021, 2022 compared to 1981, 82, 83, 84. Again, I'm not here to argue that Billie Eilish and her brother are not talented. I think it's the total opposite. But what I am here to talk about today is I just love that industrious spirit that is demonstrated on five albums I'm going to highlight today. And they all utilized different machines from the day and from earlier, you know, all the way back to the 1960s, if we talk about the Mellotron. Um, but that's today. I want to talk about, I'm calling this thing Men and Machines 1981-1984. Hope you enjoy it. is, well, everything, and uh, everything else is superfluous. And that's probably a terrible state to be in, but uh, I just live and breathe music, uh, whether it's playing guitar or playing the piano or listening to records or collecting records or watching music videos or all sorts of stuff like that. My whole life revolves around my ears. to lose my hands or something wouldn't be able to play I think uh, the worst thing for me would be to go deaf I mean that would be the end of my life and uh, that's all I do I, I just live music
do have a small-ish collection of guitars. I'd love to be able to have a, a, a house full of vintage guitars, but there are so many people collecting guitars that most of the nice ones have already been collected and are sort of sitting uh, sitting around in uh, ex-Jimi Hendrix Roadie's lofts, sort of collecting money. This is a Schecter. Now this is a sort of nuclear-powered Fender Telecaster design, but uh, it's, been, it's made out of really beautiful materials. The woods are wonderful and it's got this beautiful natural sustain. I don't know what, exactly what the wood is. I think it's ash. And the neck is maple. And these pickups are beautiful and it's just, it's a very <laughs> expensive guitar and a, but a beautifully made and wonderfully sound, wonderful sounding guitar. And I love it. I just love that clip. Uh, you know, case in point, Dave Gregory, a musician's musician, playing real instruments, using tape machines. Uh, there was a little uh, little mini Moog there as well, I think, or some kind of a small synthesizer that he had uh, above the piano. I don't think any of that music that he was working on actually appeared in uh, any XTC uh, songs or albums. If I'm wrong on that, please uh, let me know in the comments because I'm, I'm curious to find that out. Um, but why was Dave, he seemed to have a lot of leisurely time. He was, he was going through his guitar collection. What the heck was going on? Because we know XTC toured relentlessly up in the early years, uh, all the way up, uh, all the way up until English settlement, right? What happened is that Andy Partridge had a mental breakdown of sorts, um, caused by you know being taken off of Valium. Uh, and there were issues with stage fright and just an apprehension to kind of put himself out there again. Um, so he retreated. He retreated to his to his garden, to his backyard. Um, and Colin and and Dave basically were forced to retreat as well. T so was Terry Chambers. Uh, before Terry Chambers decided to kind of throw it in and, and he had moved to Australia in the meantime between the kind of English settlement gestation period and touring and then what would become uh, the next album released finally in August of 1983, at least in the UK. I don't think it was released until uh, winter of 1984 in the United States. I'm talking about Mummer. This is the uh, this is the Geffen copy that I have uh, the U.S. release. Mummer, at first, it kind of threw me for a loop. And if you look at that cover image, you know, kind of shadows and veiled veils are happening here, kind of murky, kind of cloudy. That was the kind of opinion that I first had when I when I listened to this album. And it was one of the later XTC albums that I attempted to get into. Uh, I did a ranking video last year. And I'm already, you know, reassessing Mummer as, as a, a work of art, or as an album in time. I think I would rank it higher if I were to reshoot and redo and reassess a ranking of all of the XTC albums. There's a quote from Andy Partridge saying that with Mummer, the band went from black and white from the previous albums with all of that reverb and that incredible snare drum that is so prevalent on the Black Sea and the double album English Settlement they went to a more sophisticated, a more jazz-inflected uh, sound with a lot more nuance and more tape loops, more synthesizers, more Mellotron um, with uh, 
Mummer and then also into the Big Express. With Mummer, you can definitely hear that distinctive early 80s sound of the fretless bass that you hear on a, a lot of other albums as well. I'm going to highlight a few of those today. Uh, but it is a very unique album. You know, um, the, uh, the Ape label, which Andy Partridge is affiliated with, put out this reissue of Mummer uh, back in May of this year. Uh, there's the, the hype sticker, if you could read that. They've been doing an incredible job with these reissues. Everything is issued on 200 gram heavyweight vinyl, um, remastered. These things sound incredible. And uh, this is definitely the way you want to hear Mummer. If you if you haven't heard the this reissue yet, it's well worth seeking out if you're a fan of the album. It actually includes the original uh, intended artwork that, that Andy and the band wanted to run with that was denied um, by Virgin in the UK. But... Uh, this is a really, really interesting album. I love the songs. Uh, the big song off Mummer was Love on a Farm Boy's Wages. A beautiful, intricate, acoustic uh, Andy Partridge song. But I also love some of these more nuanced and, and kind of out there and ambient uh, songs like me and the Wind and Deliver Us from the Elements. Uh, Beating of Hearts, of course, is very interesting. Lady Bird, um, less ambient, but more of a straight-up pop tune. One of the best things uh, that they've ever recorded. Anyway, that is Mummer XTC 1983 released in the UK. Not released in the United States until... You know, I think January or February of 1984. Uh, but heavy use of Mellotron, uh, heavy use of, of different tape loops and, and early synthesizers. Uh, Synclavier comes to mind. Uh, the Fairlight as well. I don't know if they were using the Fairlight. Uh, but the next album I'm going to talk about includes heavy use of the Fairlight computer music instrument. Should help the situation. Um, How would you like to see it, Rob? There's no way back for the music industry now. It'll, it'll just disappear up its own little hole in the middle of the black plastic. Uh, it, it's, it's got so geared to consumerism and commercialism. It's got so finely honed that uh, they now make the music to fit the, to fit the requirement rather than trying to sell the music. Do you see what I'm saying? <clears throat> they don't say, okay, well, they've made some music. Let's go and sell this. Nowadays, it's, could you make it more? Yeah, that's right. Okay, now we know where to place that. You know, it's like brick making. Yeah. If you make a brick that's slightly triangular, that's not any good. They can't flog that because they, they can't fit it in the wall. You know, they can't get it in there. But uh, they know that people are going to want these little square bricks. So, you know, you make a square one. Oh, yeah, we can sell that. And that is why we're so out on our limb, because, you know, we're not doing that. We're making the music that we want to make. Mm. And we're saying to the record company, OK, there it is, go and flog it. A thoughtful solo artist who takes immense care in writing and producing his own material. He's had big popular hit songs with Salisbury Hill and Games Without Frontiers, but he's never turned his successes into formulas. And so some uh, will have been from bits heard on the radio, some will have been from bits on uh, records that friends have given me or that I've come across in shops. Um, there was a couple of things which I got my uh, little handheld cassette machine and stuck to the telly. I think there were a couple of World About Us programs and they had something on Swaziland and Bali. And uh, But I think this was something, some Ghanaian uh, thing which I uh, stole a rhythm from Q 
key words, no formulas, and the music he wanted to make couldn't apply more to an artist like Peter Gabriel. And the 1982 album, the fourth solo album, self-titled or actually known now as Security, what an incredible piece of work. You know, most people will will start and stop with Shock the Monkey, but you need to listen to the entire album in its entirety. I mean, put it on side A, listen to side A, flip it over and listen to side B. Rhythm of the Heat, San Jacinto, I Have the Touch, The Family and the Fishing Net. Wow. Lay your hands on me, the out there wallflower, and then kiss of life, featuring longtime compatriots and, and musicians and partners of Peter Gabriel, like Jerry Murata on drums, the, the fantastic Tony Levin, speaking of fretless bass, <laughs> uh, David Rhodes, lead guitar. He wasn't on this album, but, but guess who else has guested on a Peter Gabriel album in the past? Dave Gregory from XTC. This is a great sounding original early pressing uh, on Geffen USA. I would love to get my hands on the uh, audiophile-esque QuiX2 pressing. I don't have that, but I'm looking for it. And what about Shock the Monkey? What an incredible hit that that was off of this album, Security. Uh, did I get the year wrong? I think this was 1982. I was right, 1982. And go watch that show on YouTube. It's uh, Peter Gabriel. It's, it's an old South Bank show from the UK. He goes way, way, way in depth on the Fairlight computer music instrument. Uh, one of the early really, really interesting synthesizers that went on to be very, very prevalent into the mid to late 1980s. Um, there was a famous Phil Collins album where uh, he actually made a point in the liner night notes of saying no fair light was used in the recording of this album. Um, great, great, great album. Another musical genius was Mark Hollis in his band, Talk Talk. This is the 84 release, It's My Life, with the, the hit on the album being the, the title track, but so much more than that, as, as the entire you know, catalog of Talk Talk is. The further we go in that catalog, the more nuanced, the more sophisticated, the more jazz-inflected, um, the music becomes, but again, fantastic use of auxiliary machine-like instruments, like synthesizers, like the Mini Moog, like the Synclavier, uh, all the way back to uh, the Mellotron again as well. Um, this is a incredible piece of work. The last album I wanted to mention and talk about was 1984, The Story of a Young Heart. Um, this is uh, an incredible, <laughs> I've been saying incredible too much lately. This is the third Flock of Seagulls album, that little band from Liverpool, uh, led by the Score Brothers, you know, Mike Score up front. It was a lot more than about his hair. Uh, namely, the guitarist in the band, the incredible Paul Reynolds, and not to mention Ali Score, great drummer, famously used uh, the electronic Simmons drum kit. Uh, go watch that footage uh, from the US Festival from 1982, I believe, or might have been the 83 US Festival. They've got the entire flock of seagulls set up uh, up there that you can watch. Um, and I don't want to give any short shrift to their 
incredibly nimble bass player, Frank Maudsley. Um, you know, it kind of warms my heart to look at the credits on this album. And this was on the Jive label, a subsidiary of uh, Arista, Arista. And uh, I love seeing this. All songs written by M Score, A Score, F Maudsley, and P Reynolds. So when they got along, they got along. It all kind of started to fall apart after this album. The huge hit, of course, The More You Live, The More You Love. One of the better flock singles. What a great album. Uh, I don't like uh, the fact that uh, Mike Score is out there touring, calling himself Flock of Seagulls with three supporting players, with zero emotion and just the vibe that those guys had. Go, go watch that concert. Um, at the US Festival. They, they were kind of in a huddle before they were announced. Uh, and, and, and you'd know that Mike Score was not the one always calling the shots. There was equal, um, a lot of equal love and affection among those guys when it was good. Uh, but in when it was good, it was great. That is Flock of Seagulls, one of my favorite bands. Last but not least, an album that really kind of led the way that, you know, when Peter Gabriel said he was checking out different records and shops and things, it wasn't only African Imports and other albums. I have a feeling that he, he, uh, he paid attention to this album. Uh, and some of the some of the soundscapes that were created, and uh, that kind of paved the way for other other artists that were interested in kind of pushing the boundaries as far as sound was concerned, um, leading on on loops and leaning on other instrumentations and machine assisted uh, soundscapes. Um, that is Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, the 1981 Architecture uh, and Morality. Um, what an incredible album. I've got a U.S. Epic copy here. Um, also happens to be um, a nice little gold stamped promo. Always fun to find those. Great, great, great album. Incredible soundscapes again. Um, a very kind of a revolutionary album that um, I'm repeating myself now. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching. That was today's video showcasing five albums. Um, again, Machine and Men and Soundscapes and Textures and Nuance. All of these albums are fantastic. I highly encourage you all to discover them or rediscover them, whatever the case may be for you. Thanks a lot for watching.